Hi, if you if you were around on day zero, assuming that we're zero indexing these days, uh, you may know that I was one of the people presenting unsafe ASM and reflection and w the terrible ideas behind it. So I since then I've gone ahead and through the suggestion of a couple people, I've gone ahead and made a, a presentation of such things. For example, we have this. Uh, now is the great time to pull out uh, your uh, scopes and things, because this is a whole lot of code. And the whole thing will be a whole lot of code, and it will be uh, quite tiny, to say the least. <laughs> no tests shall be issued. But here we have a fantastic class. I'm just going to start out in the very top line is unsafe. Now, this is not just called unsafe because it would be a static view of the Java or the Sun unsafe file. No, this is actually uh, a class to access other, uh, other kinds of unsafe. So, for example, here the very first three sets of or the first three lines inside the try block uh, grab the unsafe field. This is much simpler than I showed in the showcase uh, on whatever day that was on Friday, because this instead uh, does not care about modern versions and instead just goes ahead and creates a sun miss unsafe against the will of the JVM. Next, we're going to next the big block of code gets the uh, the lookup, the trusted lookup, as I had said before, indicated with the step one comment. A simple five lines do the exact same things that I had shown before, uh, but now using the sun's the sun misc unsafe directly rather than through a whole lot of method calls. But then we have to the fun part, where in order to get the JDK internal unsafe, we have to export the package at runtime, because as far as the JVM knows, we have no we uh, we're not allowed to actually do this. So we have a fun little thing where we go ahead and grab the method using our new trusted lookup to get the uh, ability to add an export of a module at runtime. And then we go ahead and do that for the everyone module, which means every single module uh, across or pretty much every single class in the entire JVM. That's the fun thing where then we go ahead and take full advantage of that to end up with having three objects. We set in objects uh, field for the sun unsafe, the JDK internal unsafe and the trusted method handle lookup. If anything fails, which I haven't yet had that happen to me, then it would just completely crash and burn. So that's fun. On the right side, we have just the accessor methods and things uh, for the particular class. And that is about it for this. If you have any questions about this class, now is the time to ask them. So that way I can review them while well, this is... Uh, or until, or once, or wow, words are hard. I can answer the questions as soon as you send them in and not having to wait till the end because it's going to get a whole lot worse right after this. Okay, so we have one non-question from Anonymous. Um, it says, nerd. That is correct.
We have an incoming question here, and my thing is just breaking on me, so that's no good. Uh, what's the point of getting the unsafe class? The point is so that way you can do things that you're not supposed to, such as completely destroying the JVM's actual internal processes and allowing you to do some ridiculous things. Also, I think I need to grab a new uh, monitor thing because mine is bugging out, so that's fun. Hold on. All right, well, I don't see any more questions, and I don't see anyone throwing questions in, so I shall continue to the worst part. Get ready, or just leave, because it's about to get awful, and we are going to spend the rest of this presentation, which is uh, eight more slides, on one single class. So, here we go, assuming I can make it show. This is the start of the big old class I call Mega Proxy. This is a class which is designed to allow you to create an any arbitrary subclass in in the same way that you can use a or one of the reflection uh, proxies to implement any arbitrary interface. This is extremely concern. A good suggestion is to never do this, and yet here we are. So, uh, I have reorganized it from how it is in the source code. You can actually find this if you look on my GitHub repository, or my uh, GitHub account. Uh, it's under the project named Quilt But Less OK. In here, I'm showing, or this, this particular slide shows the basics. The basics being a method to redefine a class with instrumentation, which is elsewhere, and I didn't mention it uh, because it actually has some uses, but uh, instrumentation is not meant to be used in the way that I have it here. But we can just continue on. Then we have a method for ensuring if we are in a DCEVM. DCEVM being short for Dynamic Class Evolution Virtual Machine. AKA, what if a JVM but had more abilities to change classes and things? It is slightly concerning and it is not really used in many scenarios. The most common use for a DCEVM is for debugging, but of course, uh, instead we're, we're using it here in case we want to do some extra concerning things. And more specifically, we're checking for the JVM flag. This is a whole nother class in the Quilt but that's okay that I'm not getting into, uh, where uh, it's it'd be specified on the command line as allow or an allow enhanced class redefinition. I have no clue what it is in non-JetBrains runtime DC VMs, but this is good enough. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't, too bad. And of course, if it is, if it is a compatible runtime, I go ahead and force DC EVM on. So that way we can do all of the, con the questionable runtime modifications. In the bottom here is a small four-line bit of code here to create an interface called has class bytes. This is a simple interface to allow you to actually read back the modified byte or the, the generated bytes of a class. This is going to get so much more concerning shortly, so be ready for that. It's time for, oh, okay, well, there's more questions. Uh, question one from Alex Muse on Kit. I have no clue what the rest of the name is. Uh, it's nerd. That is correct. Uh, 
then the next question is, what is the difference between the two unsafe classes? That is a fantastic question. Uh, the difference comes down to the internals and what each of them can do, and the fact that the JDK internal unsafe is not ever meant to be accessed by end users. The Sun Misc unsafe was an implementation detail, and because of its extensive use in certain uh, libraries and things, it became the primary method of running fairly optimized code in some frameworks. But it was always an implementation detail, and the JDK was not a fan of having it public. So instead what they did was create a JDK internal unsafe, which you can only get access to if you are the JDK. Of course, that, that statement is a bit wrong, as uh, I had showed in that previous thing that, yes, you can actually access it outside of the JDK. But the ideas behind that were so that way the JDK can more easily access internal uh, ma memory management within Java code without having to do a boatload of uh, very specific native methods and such. So the sun, for the anything that's Java, I think nine and later, the JDTK internal misc unsafe exists, and uh, any calls to sun misc unsafe just uh, go directly to JDK internal. Is this being recorded or streamed? Yes. Uh, I know that some other people are recording it, and I am also streaming my perspective of it, even though you wouldn't be able to hear me on my own stream. That is fun. Have fun with that. Uh, why do the JDK devs want to eradicate unsafe and make code slower? I don't know how much of it is wanting to make the code slower, but more so that unsafe is just not really a good idea in general. You should not give programs essentially immediate access to memory. It gets to be troublesome. I have a feeling that if you were to ask the actual JDK devs, they'd suggest something like implementing JNI. But in some situations like Minecraft mods, that's not really a pleasant thing to do. I know some mods... Okay, Jasmine says you that even JDK devs don't want JNI. Don't know what they'd want, but... Well, probably method handles, actually. But, yeah, so... It's iffy, so that's fun. Uh, we have yet another non-question. Rabbit2. No clue, but okay. Uh, why are you using JDK internal in a JRE? <laughs> Here's the fun fact. J the JDK internal misc unsafe almost certainly exists in the JRE. <laughs> I have no clue what, what, what they actually did internally, but I'm almost certain that, JD, that JDK internal would exist in just a normal Java runtime environment. But as lots of people are saying, you really can't get just a plain old JRE. It, you're pretty much always installing an entire JDK if you are getting a, any kind of modern one. Um, unless, unless some company or something distributes a strange, weird one. So, uh, that's fun. Jasmine is g providing plenty of insight because she actually does things with the JDK and I just make really cursed Minecraft mods. So, uh, yeah, she can provide a whole lot more uh, information. Uh, now we have more things. As you can see here, I added a comment which says, whoops, programming mistake. The thing is, it's only sort of a programming mistake because in theory, the, the double equals that I use should in theory always result in a... <laughs> It should always result in 
the proper equality being checked because although it's reference equality, it's to a primitive class. Or actually, it's, it's not to a primitive class here, but it's to what the JVM actually responds is the class type. And so assuming that the native code of java.get class is consistent and just returns one single class instance, in theory, that should that uh, uh, reference equality check should never actually have problems. But who knows? Anyway, let's look at the rest of this uh, equals method here. We have equals two classes because the fun thing is what if, um, what if we want to do funky class checks? So if a equals b. This is the same kind of thing as underneath, but you know, if A equals B reference equality, it's true. If A or B is null, then it's false, because you can't have a null object equal a non-null object. And then if A is a primitive, then we make sure that uh, either... Uh, oh, wow. I cannot remember how this reads. Good job, me. I think I programmed this wrong, but either way, it works good enough for what I need it to. But underneath is the box method. Box method as in not the way that you're, that you're factoring things, but instead a method for boxing types. Fantastic. It takes in a method visitor. It grabs a type. And it sticks the... It, it sticks the value of call on here. This is a bit misleading of a name because what this actually does is it appends a it appends a method onto a given or it, it yeah it appends a method call into a given method instruction set to box a given primitive, which is really fun and necessary for some of the code coming up here which uh, just gets more and more concerning here is the beginning of the main method of the class we have new subclass get ready this is big this is going to be the rest of the slides and we are on I have no recollection which slide we are on slide 5 there are 10 slides in this, so that means there are five more after this one of just this method. I should absolutely have split this out into multiple classes, but oh well. Here we have some actual Java doc for once. It's fantastic because it's meant to be used by others. And this method here is designed to given some class, some constructor parameters, and some collection of functions, create one big old mess of a subclass. In the start, we have two methods which guarantee that given uh, that specific modules will be exported. Quat does not like this. That is completely reasonable. Uh, next, after we ensure that some modules are uh, exported at runtime, not at compile time, we don't care what other mods have for compile time, or even that they're specified at runtime to be exported. We just force it ex to be exported so that way we can run code from it. After we ensure that that will be true, then we go ahead and get the current class version so that way we know what, what kind of sub or what subclass we're compiling to. You. And by compiling, I mean assembling. This is all going to be assembly for. Er, pretty much ASM stuff from here on out. And then we come up with a name for the class. It's very concerning. Have fun with that. After a whole lot of things, we get the superclass name 
as an internal name, and we get the new name for this particular class. It is also very concerning, highly unsuggested. Uh, and then we have the first call to ensure DCEVM in the is final check. If you have a final class and you want to extend, or if you want to subclass a final class, it will not let you, as you might know. It will fail on compile time, and it will fail upon verification. So we have to make sure that a DCEVM is available, so that way we can redefine the superclass to not have the final modifier. That is what this first if block does. Uh, be ready, it gets worse. Remember, questions are open at all times because this gets complicated the whole time. Next, we have this disgusting beast. We have a check against final methods. Now, a final class check is really easy to do. A final method check requires a whole lot of code and making sure that we are not requiring the DCEVM for things that we shouldn't need. Uh, the text is small. Uh, this is like the only reasonable way I could fit it all in nicely. So there's the zoom mod. You have to set your keybind up in your control settings because of keybind overrides and things. Or you can use the spyglass to also look at here. Virtual, the original goal in this whole thing is to extend any given class no matter if it's an interface or not. So in this, for, in this while block here, we go ahead and walk through the entire class tree. Until we get back to object, we go ahead and check, is, are we in object? If, if not, we will continue on, but if we are, then we're done, fantastic. But until then, we grab the methods, all of the methods in the class with the get declared methods class or er, uh, method. Then we go ahead and create descriptors in there. We double check if any methods actually apply to it. And if, if a single method is overridden, then we have to make sure that that method is not final. If it is not final, then it would need re it will need modification. Or if it is private or only available within its uh, package, it will also need modification. Because remember, we are not sticking this in the class or in the target class's package. We are sticking this in the calling class's package. So, assuming that w one of the methods requires some kind of fi or visibility or final removal or something like that, then we go ahead and double check, hey, is it DCEVM? If it's not, once again, we fail, as always, because otherwise there'd be a verification error, and who wants that? Why have a verification error when we can just throw an unsupported operation exception or something like that a few milliseconds earlier. So we go through all of this. We ensure that we read the method or uh, the class, modify the methods, redefine the classes with the modified methods, and continue on our way. That is this slide. I shall now check for questions before I go on to the next slide. All right, from Anonymous, we have about checking the superclasses. What if the class doesn't extend object? Say it's a custom JVM or something. That sounds even more cursed than the stuff I'm doing, so I didn't even consider it. In theory, every class eventually extends object, except for object, which doesn't. All right, now to the next part. 
Uh, now that we've ensured that any redefinitions higher up on the tree have been corrected, we now have to get the correct constructor. Because remember, we're instantiating an object of this as well. So we need to find the super constructor that we can call. And once we find a, yes, you, uh, the person who's just asking, yes, you can replace object. It's a terrible idea, but you can replace object. Because we're replacing, or er, because we are calling a super constructor, we need to find which one we're actually calling. First, we filter down to ensure that we have only a constructor for the number of parameters we have. And if found, then we go ahead and ensure that we have the correct kinds of constructors. People are noticing my label is a URL to a domain that I own. Uh, because Java will accept that as a syntactically valid label. And if you add a semicolon on any, or if you add any kind of uh, expression in, on later lines, it does in fact compile. So in this case, it is a label to the for loop. So that way we can break from it just for fun. Assuming we find a match somewhere, we go ahead and state that that is the constructor. And if we don't find a constructor, we immediately fail because we know for a fact that we will not be able to create an instance of it. Once we've done all that, then we go ahead and finally, after like two and a half slides, we create an instance of an ASM class node. This is going to be the pain that works into all of it. We go ahead and set the initial sta state. We have the current class file version, which we found earlier. We make sure that our resulting class is public and only public. Uh, we give it a new name. We give it... Uh, no signature, or yeah, signature. We get we tell it the superclass's name, uh, and then we go ahead and give it the uh, has class bytes interface as well. The reason we do this is purely so that way, a future callers down the line, for if for some reason they want to, can find the bytes that were actually written to make this work. Then we have to go ahead and define both a map for the methods or the functions as well as the class bytes field that we would be returning from the has class bytes uh, function or the interface definition thing. Still no questions, so I shall continue on to this thing. Wait, this wait, wait, is I have weird. a question really Okay, question. Uh, what if um, there's a conflicting map or class bytes field? This does not inherit any fields. In fact, the only two fields that will be in the created class will be the map and the uh, class bytes fields. Everything else is assumed to be passed entirely uh, f through functions that are defined externally and therefore have no reference to this specific class itself. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like, um, uh, like a super field. I have no clue what you mean by that, but like a field in like a super class, but like you can like accidentally shadow it or something like you can have like this, a... this might accidentally shadow it but the as far as i know the java runtime does not care because you are referencing any any fields that you are referencing are always going to be of the super class and not of the subclass i i mainly mean like what if like what is this like in a um is are you putting this in like an actual class that's already being used or 
like like that has other fields in it, or does it only have map and class bytes? This this is a new class being generated at runtime with only the two fields. Oh, okay, never mind. So here's the fun part. Here is where we have the constructor. This is one big block of code. It does all of the constructor code, and that is all that it does. It goes ahead and gets a string. Or we create a string builder because that's the easiest way to go about it. Then we go ahead and uh, append all of the parameters that will be passed to the super constructor, followed by an extra map parameter and a byte array parameter to then end up uh, with the void return as it's expected. Then we go ahead and create the method, making sure that it is public and non-static. The name is init, which is the internal name of a constructor, and we give it the descriptor we have showed before. Null for there are no, uh, there, it's, there's no signature, and I cannot for the life of me remember what the other null is, but someone probably does. After we create the method, uh, we then have to load the first thing, which is the this, followed by all of the th other things. It goes ahead. I have. N I think I did something wrong here. I'm surprised that I, it works. Uh, and maybe I just didn't test enough, but. I believe it is missing a little bit of code. Maybe it's later on that to load all of the parameters it needs in the superclass. Not sure. Oh, exceptions. Okay, that's what the last null is. But yeah, so things happen. We go ahead and in invoke the super uh, constructor because that is required in bytecode. If you saw the EMI presentation, even if there's a no const or a no whatever it's called, the, uh, I think it's called a default constructor by some people. If there is there a no, if there's a no args constructor, it still has to call the super constructor. So then it goes ahead and uh, loads up the map and class bytes. And after all that, it calls it good. That's the end of the constructor because we literally don't have anything of importance to do here. We have this question. Uh, I think it was the one that was talked about before. So, oh no, this is a different one. Does the has class bytes method cause issues if the superclass is a public method of the same name and signature? Probably. This this is almost certain. This would almost certainly actually be a problem were it not for uh, the fact it's actually called get class bytes, but. Uh, they, it's very unlikely that a superclass would have the get class bytes thing, and I believe if you wanted to, you could just overwrite it anywhere because I'm pretty sure the get class bytes method is defined prior to the method calls to uh, the functions that you provide. So if there is a get class bytes method somewhere along the lines that matches both name and signature if the if no other method is defined by the end user of this uh, creation then the then the JVM would interpret it as getting the class bytes that I have set uh, prior but if for some odd reason it that's not actually the case and it does other funky things well it's all right i'm almost certain that the get class bytes if or if defined by the end user would apply and not our own code well we could check here because this is the second to last slide here uh get ready this, this is even more pain we have the method definitions This is the concerning part, and also I was wrong then. So, get class bytes will be overridden by my own code. 
have fun with that if you have that method that you want special stuff to happen. But oh well. What we have here is what this one person says. Uh, I have implemented a V table, sort of. It's funky. It does, it does act a lot like a V table. It goes ahead and essentially just creates for every method that you have passed in a, a temporary method that allows you to get the uh, arguments that you need. Of course, it does also have to wrap it in, a, in an object array because functions are weird. So it wraps it in one big object array and expects that either you're going to return something or if it's null, oh well. So it does fun things. It goes ahead and the top bit of code is a whole lot of basic things to get the proper things. I hope I named them all or at least reasonable so that way it's easy to understand. Then we define the method, state that all we're doing is getting the map and then getting the function from the map. And then you, then knowing things, we go ahead and stick a per parameter, or we create a new object array of a specific length. Go ahead and stick for every single item in the, that, that we need. Go ahead and put all the parameters into the object array and then pass it along at the very end to the function interface, the apply method. After all of that, we grab the return value. If it is the correct kind of thing, then we double check. Otherwise, we just go on away. Uh, we cast it if necessary because, of course, we have to cast it. Uh, but then... We return as necessary, and that is how each individual method gets defined. It is so very cursed. Here is our final slide, and I'm surprised that it, on, on the current time, I was thinking that it'd be shorter than this, but whatever works. Here we have the get class bytes method at the very top, as we had d stated before. If you do, did write a get class bytes that only that takes no arguments and returns a byte array, sorry, I should eventually fix that if you for some reason are actually wanting to use this library. Suggestion, don't. But either way, here is uh, a simple couple of lines to get the class bytes field, return it, and call it good, followed by the writing stage. Now, the writing and instantiation stages are simpler in comparison <laughs> but each part is a bit special the first part the writing stage goes ahead and makes the ASM library do the actual computing of the stack and frames so that way we don't have to do it because it would hurt goes ahead and uh, writes the entire class to a byte array and calls it good and then it uses the trusted lookup from the very beginning that I showed with the caller class as what it's looking up as to define a subclass. I got pushed by something, I have no clue, but oh well. I shall continue. Uh, there's this fun little comment here that if in the case of an illegal access exception, it would just throw, but it, says, it has a comment that states that it isn't possible the trusted lookup never throws this exception. Because the trusted lookup is so special. It is a really funky thing. It has full permissions to the entire JVM. And as a result, it, can, it physically cannot uh, throw an illegal access exception as nothing is being accessed illegally through the trusted lookup. To finish off this method, the very last thing here is the instantiation phase. First, grab to grab new parameters. We use arrays.copy of because it does the system array copy 
for us and also creates a new array on its own. So we could do that. It goes ahead and then sticks the method in bytes at the very end. Then their parameter types are instantiated in a similar way. And then finally, we use a trusted we use the trusted lookup. We don't really need to, but we do it anyway to find the constructor of the arbitrary class with a method type that returns void because this is a constructor and the parameter types necessary and we invoke it with a set of arguments to end it all off. That is a really confusing thing. That is how I've created a class-based proxy and that is why uh, I would suggest no one ever does anything like this ever again. We have a question here from Anonymous. It is, what is utils.justthrow? It is a small utility method which takes advantage of generics and unchecked casting to uh, throw any kind of error that we give to it without the JVM compiler knowing about it. It is literally just a compiler time cleanup code thing. And also for to keep the stack nice and tidy in the case an exception does get thrown. Now, if, if, if we do look back at uh, this, uh, we do have this throw error. It's, it's always casted to an error in the situations where I use utils.justthrow because just throw uh, actually has two generics to it. It has the one necessary for the unchecked uh, exceptions to be thrown, and it has a second generic to specify the return type. Now, if we're using it in this uh, throw whatever situation, we just want the return type to act as an error, so we specify that outright with that code. Why are we implementing the has class bytes for the odd scenario where someone might want the actual bytes that were implemented here? If you were to try to get the class bytes with something like the, I forget how it goes, the, the, I think it's get resources, the name of the method, you would not be able to actually get the class bytes from that. And so in an odd scenario where you might want uh, class bytes for something or other, this is essentially the a reasonable way of getting around that problem. Also because I do cursed things and that's just sometimes what happens. Uh, I have nine minutes before I have to give this up for the next person. If you have any more questions, now is the time to ask them. Until then, I don't know what to do. We have a question in chat. <laughs> Why am I doing any of this in the first place? Because I can. That's about it. Here's a fantastic question. Is there a reason we're using live class reloading and not just transforming classes on the first load? The reason that we do these uh, class transformations with reloading is because there is no guarantee that we do not know what's going, what's going to want to be changed. And because we don't know what's, what will want any subclassing or anything like that, we have to do a class reload when, when necessary instead of transforming because there's no guarantee that we will be able to anyway. Now, of course, if someone wanted, they could be the parent class loader and transform everything to be public and non-final by default which would allow anything in the future, like my very concerning things, to work as intended. Is Odin wanting to see my code? Because this is not the good way.
Why am I so nerd? Yes. The end. Actually, there's still seven more minutes of this time slot, so I'll be here. But why am I such a nerd? Who knows? It, I just, it just happens, so, uh, yeah. Hey, Will, if you're here, uh, which slide did you first see? I can show you the, the concerned things that went into the previous slides. I love how I have Discord open on the other window just so I can see the server chat. And I also and it's actually on a different computer so I could see other things as well. Uh give give sound check? No. No, I do not give sound checks. I just end up forgetting about things in general and yeah, so that's that's about it. Uh, why so nerd? Because yes. Ooh, I've been informed of a of a loader plugin thread. Go go ahead and mention me in the thread so that way I get automatically put into it so I can see it more better. Five minutes left. Have fun for uh, future folks. Um, there's, I still have more questions being tossed in there. Uh, the next presentation is by Will Be Out, so have fun with the future. How do we pronounce my name? You don't. Many people, especially in like the quilt scene, uh, tend to call me Chris, and it's all G Dude's fault, but I will just leave it at that. Uh, why so, Jock? No. I'm so glad that I had water before I started speaking because every time I speak, I always forget about it until I get lots of things. Um, Scale my nerdiness from I have a computer to to I launch rockets and track them with five twelve kilobytes of RAM. That is a harder one. Who knows? Uh, it's up for interpretation. I would not be able to tell you things because I wouldn't bother with trying to figure those things out. I just do concern things because I can. I have another question here. What? Uh, the answer is good luck. This is one particular class that I wrote. I have written much more concerning things in general. <laughs> so that's fun. Uh, we have another non question. Just says nerd. Uh, yes. I did see uh, Emmy's speech. It was fantastic. I, I enjoyed every bit of it and then saw some of myself in it. I've done some similar things with it, so that's fun. A smooth brain was very confused. Well, okay then. Hi, hello there. I'm, I don't know. Uh, are there pl uh, plushies of me hidden somewhere. I do not know. You'd have to ask the event organizers. I'm just an, I'm just a person who loves doing very cursed things to Minecraft and the JVM. Uh, meow, possibly. <laughs> 